Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 40, Michael Crichton. Crichton is maybe the biggest author from my lifetime who really deserves his own episode. Just as Larry Niven was a big influence on the 70s and 80s in sci-fi, Michael Crichton was just as big an influence on the 90s and 2000s, even though he got his start earlier. Crichton is also one of what you might call the big three sci-fi authors of Hollywood, who has gotten lots and lots of movie adaptations made of his work. In this case, the other two would be Philip K. Dick and Stephen King. Of the three, Crichton was the most involved in Hollywood himself. He personally directed the original Westworld in 1973, the movie adaptation of his novel The Great Train Robbery, and a few others, and he also co-created the TV medical drama ER. But of course, it's the adaptations of his other books that are best known, most famously with Jurassic Park, but also The Andromeda Strain, which was adapted twice, The Carey Treatment, based on the novel A Case of Need, Pursuit, based on the novel Binary, The Terminal Man, Rising Sun, Disclosure, Congo, Sphere, The Thirteenth Warrior, based on the novel Eaters of the Dead, Timeline, and something called Dealing or the Berkeley to Boston Forty Brick Lost Bag Blues, which Crichton co-wrote with his younger brother Douglas and confusingly published under the pen name Michael Douglas. So there's a lot of material here. But in this episode, I'm focusing on Crichton's books, since he's best known for those. Michael Crichton, whose first name was actually John, not to be confused with the Farscape character, had a bit of an advantage in writing growing up. You see, his father was a journalist, which inspired him to start writing pretty young. His first publishing credit was an article about a trip to Sunset Crater, Arizona, which was published in the New York Times travel section when he was 14. Crichton went to Harvard, intending on pursuing a career in writing, but he dropped his English major after discovering that his professor was grading him unfairly. Instead, he decided to become a doctor. He graduated with a B.A. in Biological Anthropology in 1964, and soon returned to enroll in Harvard Medical School. While in med school, he wrote his first novel, Odds On, a techno-crime thriller written mostly to pay the bills. In all, he wrote four novels in his first three years of med school, including A Case of Need, all under pseudonyms. At that point, he decided he liked writing better after all, and started using his real name. His first novel under his own name was The Andromeda Strain in 1969, and it was an instant hit. Within months, he sold the film rights for the then enormous sum of $250,000. Crichton did finish his degree at Harvard Medical shortly afterward, but he never became a practicing physician. Since he already had a good thing going, and now financial security, he switched almost immediately to writing full-time. After the Andromeda Strain film came out in 1971, Crichton used its success to negotiate his way into Hollywood directly. The following year, when ABC wanted to buy the rights to Binary, his last novel under the John Lang pseudonym, Crichton attached the condition that he would be the one to direct the film. Perhaps surprisingly, ABC agreed. The resulting film, Pursuit, was enough of a success that Crichton was handed the reins entirely for Westworld, and the rest is history. The Andromeda Strain was the kind of book that was Crichton's bread and butter. The intersection of a medical thriller and a techno-thriller. In fact, many people consider it to be the first modern techno-thriller, a subgenre that was poorly defined and differentiated up to that point. The story begins when a military satellite that was designed to collect microbes from the upper atmosphere crashes in Arizona. When the recovery team goes in, they discover that the entire population of a nearby town has been killed by a strange pathogen that rapidly clots the blood. A thorough search turns up only two survivors, an old alcoholic man and a cranky baby, with seemingly no connection between them. The two survivors and the satellite are taken to a top-secret laboratory called Wildfire, where a crack team of scientists will try to figure out what the germ is, why those two people survived it, and how to stop it. The laboratory also has an automatic self-destruct system using a nuclear weapon to stop any contamination from spreading. 
Dr. Mark Hall is the only one with the key to disarm the weapon, ostensibly because he is an unmarried man and will therefore be able to make the most objective decisions. However, this is revealed to be an in-story ruse to take control of the bomb out of twitchy government hands. They do locate the microorganism in question, codenamed Andromeda, but there turn out to be some problems. Andromeda is carbon-based, but it doesn't have any of the molecular machinery that Earth life does. It goes through mutations as radical as switching from attacking human bodies to eating plastic, and it can grow by directly absorbing energy from its environment, which means that nuking it is actually the worst thing they could do. In the end, the problem actually solves itself, in spite of human intervention rather than because of it. And this is an instance of a theme that shows up again and again in Crichton's works. Many of his books carry a cautionary message against humans meddling with things that we don't understand, in this case collecting the space microbes. This generally isn't a Lovecraftian things man was not meant to know, although it kind of is in sphere. Rather, it's about respecting the power of nature and recognizing the folly of thinking we can control it. There's some wisdom there, and it's a message that was more fitting in the Cold War when we were a good deal more lax about world-ending threats. But I think it tends to be shallow and overstated as Crichton uses it. I'll come back to that in more detail in a bit, but for one, in the real world, people can usually figure out risk assessment and cost-benefit better than that. That and, let's be serious, there is no way that anything made of matter as we know it could survive a nuclear explosion in an enclosed space at point-blank range. Crichton followed up the Andromeda strain with The Terminal Man, about a man who has electrodes implanted in his brain to control his seizure disorder, but it backfires when testing the electrodes causes him to fall deeper into his underlying psychosis. This is an especially clear case of science marches on, as deep brain stimulation is an established medical technique today. After this was Westworld. I and many other people my age probably know Westworld from the HBO remake, but the broad outline is the same. A futuristic amusement park is populated by lifelike androids that let guests have adventures in different historical settings. But the androids are beginning to suffer from what is now known as a computer virus that causes them to malfunction. Real computer viruses were only beginning to be experimented with in the lab at the time, and wouldn't be called viruses for another decade. The malfunctions grow bad enough that the safety systems stop working, and the androids start killing the guests, including a gunslinger android chasing the main characters around the park until it is destroyed. Which sounds an awful lot like the plot of The Terminator now that I think about it. There was also a sequel, Future World, although that one went off on a tangent with the evil corporation behind the park replacing people who have influence over it with loyal clones. Meanwhile, in 1975, Crichton released the first of his historical novels, The Great Train Robbery. After that came Eaters of the Dead and Congo. His pace of writing slowed down in the 80s, but he was still doing good work, because next came his next really big hit, Sphere. Sphere, as I mentioned before, was the closest Crichton came to Lovecraftian fiction. The story begins with a group of scientists being called to a secret government facility. Hmm, this sounds familiar to investigate what appears to be an alien spaceship crashed on the ocean floor. But on closer inspection, it proves to be something even stranger. An American spacecraft from decades in the future that was somehow thrown back in time and crashed in the ocean in the 17th century. But there is still something alien on the ship, a mysterious sphere of unknown origin and properties. And that's where things start to go wrong. While communicating with a strange alien entity named Jerry, members of the team start dying one by one, mainly in attacks by giant squid. While the attacks are initially blamed on Jerry, they eventually discover that they are a manifestation of the team's own subconscious thoughts. The sphere somehow conveys powerful reality-warping abilities on anyone who enters it. But since it can act on subconscious thoughts too, they can't control the power, and things turn very dangerous very fast. It's an interesting, well-researched, and very suspenseful story, about like you would expect from Crichton. Crichton then followed up Sphere with his most famous novel, Jurassic Park, and its sequel, The Lost World, not to be confused with the Arthur Conan Doyle novel. You've probably heard this story before. Biotech mogul John Hammond uses DNA extracted from mosquitoes trapped in amber to clone dinosaurs and build a theme park around them. 
But in the middle of the test run, the park is sabotaged, the dinosaurs get loose, and they eat most of the people on the island. The book is not dramatically different from the movie, although there's a lot more backstory and several more people die. Incidentally, it is sadly not possible to clone dinosaurs in real life. Even preserved in amber, DNA breaks down into its individual nucleotides on a scale of thousands of years. Jurassic Park is an unfortunate case for me. I wanted to like it, and I did like it when I was in high school. But when I reread it a couple years ago, Ian Malcolm was so insufferable that he ruined the story for me. You probably remember Ian Malcolm as Jeff Goldblum's cool, skeptical mathematician in the movie, but in the book, he's much more of a jerk. He tells John Hammond that Jurassic Park is doomed to fail, but refuses to explain why. He smugly goes on and on about how science can't control nature because his chaos theory says so. And then, when Hammond finally comes around to his point of view, he goes and insults him again. It actually made me glad when he died in the book, even though he came back somewhat mellowed out in the sequel. And that's not even getting into how bad the explanation of chaos theory was. I could do a whole rant about how wrong that part was, but I'll cut Crichton some slack because he wasn't a mathematician or a physicist. And after all, most of it went over my own head when I was in high school. Long story short, chaos theory does not predict that complex systems are doomed to spin out of control. Things can be chaotic within well-defined limits. I do want to mention one thing that annoyed me both times, though. At the beginning of each section of Jurassic Park, Crichton includes a picture of a fractal called the Dragon Curve, along with a fictional quote by Ian Malcolm about the instability of chaotic systems. The implication is that the evolution of the curve parallels the breakdown of the park. But the Dragon Curve is a perfectly regular and well-ordered shape. It doesn't have any instabilities. And this is obvious from the pictures, so Crichton should have known this. This confused me the first time I read the book, and when I reread it, it only reinforced my opinion that Ian Malcolm didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Also, I feel like having the section header quotes be exclusively from one of the characters in the book is kind of a self-referential admission of how much of an arrogant jerk Malcolm is, but that still didn't help. But there's a larger problem here, one that does extend to the movie. Like many of Crichton's novels, Jurassic Park leans heavily on the science is bad trope. Now, to be fair, few writers think all science is bad, certainly not established science that's used in day-to-day -day life. But there are an awful lot of stories out there where the progress of science doesn't stop to think of the consequences and drives people into gibbering madness, or awakens a giant monster, or gets someone turned into a half-human mutant, or gets people eaten by dinosaurs. And it's usually tied up with a lesson about respecting the environment, or not degrading our humanity, or not meddling in things we quote-unquote shouldn't. The problem is that frequently, not always, but frequently, this whole line of thinking is fallacious. Science comedy writer Luke McKinney calls it the Malcolm fallacy, which he defines as, quote, blaming scientists for everyone else's mistakes, unquote. Link in the description. Obviously, the definitive case for this in Jurassic Park is Ian Malcolm's quote in the movie, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. But this is wrong, McKinney says. In his post on the topic, he writes, quote, Should we recreate awesome dinosaurs? The answer is obviously yes. Utterly yes. And a bit later, Jurassic Park's key question wasn't, should we recreate awesome dinosaurs? It was, should we unleash those awesome dinosaurs on a safari with worse security and fewer staff than the average Apple store? No, you shouldn't have done that. Unquote. And this typifies an awful lot of science is bad stories. Yes, there are stories like Frankenstein, where a scientist breaks all standards of morality and safety for science. science. But even there, the actual science worked. Victor Frankenstein's creature comes to life and would have been good and kind-hearted, except he was cruelly abandoned and mistreated by everyone he met. To a 21st century audience, the moral of the story should be not to judge people based on appearances. Not that the science itself is bad. Granted, in many cases the trope is downplayed because science is also the solution to the problem. For example, the original Gojira was awakened by nuclear weapons testing, but was also killed by the new oxygen destroyer superweapon. 
The message in that movie is a much more specific anti-nuclear one. There are also examples of the science is bad trope that avoid the Malcolm fallacy. In fact, many monster movies do qualify, where genetic engineering is portrayed as something that predictably leads to unleashing horrible monsters on the world in spite of safety precautions. But this is a space whale Aesop. It teaches that lesson based on fantastical, non-real-life consequences. It's quite a different matter to say, no, we should categorically not do research into X for Y and Z plausible reasons. This tends to happen most often in stories where artificial intelligence or virtual reality lead to the downfall of humanity. But it's slim pickings to find one that says these things are irredeemably bad. But we were discussing the Malcolm fallacy. And in many science's bad stories, the pattern remains the same. The government, or a corporation, or even an anti-scientist activist, as in 28 Days Later, does something dumb that results in the experiment going horribly wrong and the scientists get the blame for it. That is my central complaint about Michael Crichton. And yes, he can be balanced about science, but there is usually an example of that happening somewhere. And certainly Crichton is far from the only author to take this tack, but he's one of the most famous ones. In his later novels, we see the dangers of nanotechnology, prey, genetic engineering, next, and very controversially, his distrust of climate science in State of Fear in which eco-terrorists try to cause environmental disasters to stimulate political action on climate change. That one went to some weird places. There's one other book by Crichton that deserves a mention, his 1999 novel Timeline. This is Crichton's main foray into time travel, combining his usual techno-thrillers with his love of historical fiction. In Timeline, a history professor travels back in time to the year 1357, with the help of, what else, a shady corporation. Archaeologists in the present dig up some of his effects, suggesting that he may be trapped there, so some of his students go back to save him. With the time machine damaged, and finding themselves caught in the middle of a dispute between English and French lords in the Hundred Years' War, they face multiple challenges to getting home safely. Oh, and also, repeated time travel gradually causes insanity for some reason. Anyway, in terms of my categorization of time travel in episode 35, it's pretty standard time tourism fare, not all that far off from Connie Willis' Doomsday Book. And just like her book, it delves pretty deep into the dark side of the past. But of course, with the classic Michael Crichton style about it. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available from Libsyn and many other sites, the standard podcasting fare. You can find me on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction. Look for a new science video there in the near future. I'm on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction. And my own website is sciencemeetsfiction.com. My book recommendation for this episode is... <sighs> Sphere, I guess. Before my reread, I would have said Jurassic Park, but I'm not kidding. Ian Malcolm really made me hate it. Crichton doesn't go in for the Malcolm fallacy as much in his other books, but I feel like it's usually still there and I think that's why I'm not a big fan of his writing in general. It may also be why I find Sphere to be the most acceptable of his books. In that one, the scientists really are in way over their heads, and their final decision on what to do about it is maybe not the only one, but certainly a reasonable one. So yeah, I'm going with Sphere. In the next episode, we cover an important part of science fiction history that was only hinted at in this one. It's time to come back to sci-fi movies to explore the rise of the blockbuster and in particular, how CGI revolutionized the genre. Thanks for listening.